morning we have the uh, pleasure of inviting our new friend, our, uh, our shared summer intern, Ian Mays, to come forward and share uh, the Word of God with us and for us this morning. Uh, if you haven't met him before, Ian is a, a delightful young man, and uh, we're just so happy to have him in our presence today, and uh, just invite Ian forward. Would you, would you welcome Ian, please? Thank you. Light to green, so I should be on. Well, good morning again. Uh, I got told a couple weeks ago by someone in First Presbyterian Church that I never look to the right. So I think that I do have a blind spot after my last surgery. But if you're one of those people that likes to make eye contact with the pastor and you're sitting over here, go ahead and move, I won't mind. If you're one of those people that likes to nod off and hope you don't get noticed, and you're over here, go ahead and move. I won't be offended. But good morning. I want to welcome you again. I might do a wonderful job, but uh, just welcome to worship at Mount Carmel. And uh, a global welcome to all those that are worshiping around the country, around the, the world. That are worshiping the same God, the eternal God that Pastor Mike spoke about. My task today is to summarize the book of Habakkuk in about the next 20 minutes or so. Now, the first three chapters of the book of Habakkuk are an extended conversation, a back and forth between the prophet and God. But before we get to that, I want to focus on one verse, and that's chapter 1, verse 1. Probably the verse that you skipped over to get to the good part. I'll read it for you. Habakkuk 1.1, 1, 1, the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. That's it. It doesn't seem like there's much there. We have these kind of introductions all throughout the 66 books of the Bible. Uh, a letter of John to the church at Ephesus. Uh, these intros that say, this is who, who's speaking. This is what he's going to speak about. Uh, the Psalms will often say, a Psalm of David or to the choir master with lyre and flute or whatever he says to do. But this verse doesn't seem like much. We skip over these verses, but I think in this case, there's an importance to this verse that shouldn't be overlooked. So indulge me for a moment. If you'd like to flip back with me, you can, but I'll announce the verses. We're going to go back to Hosea. We're going to go through each of the 12 minor prophets, and we're going to look at chapter 1, verse 1 of each of the minor prophets. So Hosea 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. And I have some of these. I'm not saying the whole verse. I'll I'll say the the parts that I think I nail the point home. Joel 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel. Amos 1.1, 1, 1, the words of Amos. Obadiah 1.1, 1, 1, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God. Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Jonah. Micah 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah. Nahum 1.1, 1, 1, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum. Okay, we already covered the back of going one. Zephaniah 1.1, one, one, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah. Haggai 1.1, one, one, in the second year of Darius the king, on the sixth month on the first day, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai. 
Zechariah, in the eighth month, in the second day of the year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. In Malachi 1 1, a prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Now you may have noticed a bit of a pattern here. We have primarily the word of the Lord coming to nine of these 12 prophets. Only three of them get the word prophecy, and only Habakkuk gets the prophecy. I'm going to try and demonstrate why I think this is important. Now, I don't typically go back to the original language of the Old Testament, which is Hebrew. I go to C plus in Hebrew, so I had to look all this up. There's nothing magical about my knowledge here. But I want to say that the word of the Lord, that, that phrase, the word of the Lord, that we see in nine of these prophets is Davar Yahweh. Davar is the word for a word. And Yahweh is the word for God. So you, you put them together, you have the word of, the, of God to Joel or to uh, Micah. Now, Nahum and Malachi get a different word. They get uh, Masa. Sorry, reading Hebrew is still a challenge. So they get the word Masa, which is a totally different word and it means prophecy. Okay, stick with me, I'm getting there. Now, only Habakkuk gets the definite article before this noun. Now, for those of you who have been a while since your seventh grade in English class, the definite article is the word the, meaning it's not just a person, it's the person. It's how we are specific in our language. I'm not going to a church this morning, but I'm going to the church, a specific one, Mount Carmel. We don't worship a God, we worship the God. And so when Habakkuk gets the prophecy, I think there's a reason for that. So I wanted to take you back to Isaiah. And again, I'll, I'll read this for you, so if you want to move back and follow along, that's fine. But I'm going to go back to Isaiah chapter 22, starting in verse 20. And the Lord speaking here, he says, In that day I will summon to my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fashion your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will become a seat of honor for the house of his father. All the glory of his family will hang on him, its offspring and offshoots, all its lesser vessels from the bowls to the jars. And in that day, that's now verse 25, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and will fall, and the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord has spoken. Now, in the broader context of Isaiah, this is talking about the genealogies that went on in that day, and it ultimately is the genealogy of Christ. Now, Isaiah is making the point that until Christ comes, until that day, there's a load hanging on genealogy. And it's the load of the Mosaic law, it's the burden of the law that hangs on the people 
until the day of Christ when we're freed from the law. Okay, I promise it's about Habakkuk, really. The reason I take this diversion is that that word load that we heard in Isaiah, that load that will fall on the day that the peg is sheared, is the word hamasah, the same word that's translated the prophecy in Habakkuk 1.1. The reason I think this is important is none of our other prophets got that word Hamasah, and I think this is telling us that this one of the minor prophets is going to be given a heavy burden to carry on behalf of Israel. This is a burden so heavy that it shears the peg in Isaiah this burden is being given to Habakkuk on behalf of Israel. Okay, has everyone followed me so far? Okay, we've now covered in eight minutes, chapter one, verse one. How much time do I have, Mike? Okay, okay, quicker, I'm moving. So this burden, what is it? Now, I'm going to move faster, so bear with me. Try not to follow in the back end unless you're a speed reader. But verses 2 through 4 of chapter 1 are Habakkuk's first complaint. How long, O Lord, must I, must we deal with all the evil that's around us? I think most of us have said that same thing to God. Maybe this morning, maybe last week. This is common. This is how we think. Now, verses 5 through 11 are the Lord's response to Habakkuk's first complaint. And this is where we get our first inkling of the burden that Habakkuk is going to carry from God. Habakkuk says, how long do I have to put up with evil? God's response is, oh, by the way, I'm building up the Babylonians. They're going to come against you. Your, ver your version may say the Chaldeans, but basically same thing. I'm going to build up a people against you. Now, Habakkuk may be a little confused, but in case he's confused, God tells him in verse 11, he emphasizes that, look, I know these people are guilty people whose strength comes from their own God. If you're following longer, if you mark verse 11, you'll notice that's a small g God. There's no confusion here about who's being spoken of. This is the burden that's going to face Israel. This is the burden that God is just laying on the back of. Now, verse 12 through chapter 2, verse 1, is Habakkuk's second complaint. Now, Habakkuk is absolutely aware he's talking to God, okay? He knows who he's trying to address. He knows what he said the first time, and he knows that he didn't get the answer he expected the first time. So I think he's kind of not quite sure what to do. You know, it's not like a kid, my kids will come up to me and say, uh, can I play on the Wii? You know, and I say, I'm doing dishes or I'm working in the yard or whatever. It's not exactly a yes or no to the question. And I think this is where Habakkuk, like my son, Feels like he wants to ask the question again, but knows that he might get in trouble because the not answering is a no in and of itself. So we see in verse 12 and 13, Habakkuk, like my son, does a little good old-fashioned buttering up of God before he asks again. My God, my holy one, you will never die. 
Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Okay, my son has never said that to me, but you get the picture. And then you write back to his original complaint. How long do we have to put up with this? Why, God, are you silent in the face of evil? Now, just in case God didn't happen to notice Habakkuk the second time, chapter 2, verse 1, makes it clear Habakkuk's intent and his expectation with his second complaint. 2 1 says, This is Habakkuk speaking, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the rampart. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint of Israel. Now, this this is almost comical. This is where scripture comes alive. This has nothing to do with Habakkuk's complaint. This is like a parenthetical notation of Habakkuk standing there saying, okay, God, I've said it twice. I'm waiting for your response. I think Habakkuk's whistling a little tune at his station, you know, and he's waiting for the real yes or no. Now, he gets it. Chapter 2, verse 2, God replies, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets that a herald may run with it. Now, I'm reminded here of a scene from one of my favorite movies, and you're all going to get to hear it whether you've seen the movie or not, but the movie is The Princess Bride. What I think may be one of the greatest movies ever made. If you haven't seen it, go rent it and see it. It's worth your time. Totally family-friendly. But what we have is you have the good guy, Wesley, and you have the bad guy, Prince Humperdinck. Great name. Now, at the end of the movie, Humperdinck thinks he's got Wesley in the corner. Thinks he's about to uh, take care of him once and for all. So Humperdinck says, first things first, to the death. That's a sword there. Wesley says, no, to the pain. Now, Humperdinck says, I don't think I'm quite familiar with that term. And Wesley comes back, and this is where we're going to match back in. I'll explain, and I'll use small words so you'll be sure to understand. Now, read again, Habakkuk 2.2. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. The rest of chapter 2 is the Lord using small words so Habakkuk will understand clearly. This is the clarification of the burden we read about in chapter 1. The burden that Habakkuk will carry from the Lord to Israel. And the message at this point is not a positive one. The message, in fact, flies in the face of Habakkuk's complaint. God says, you, I'm paraphrasing here, God says, you have the nerve to ask me how long you have to wait in the face of injustice. Israel, Habakkuk, let me explain to you your injustices. God spends the the bulk of chapter 2 telling Habakkuk, about the injustice of Israel. It's violence against itself, against its neighbors. He details 
the unjustness of their financial transactions. Israel is building itself up as a nation on the backs of social injustices. Verse 11 of chapter 2. This is so bad that the stones of the walls are crying out and the beams of the buildings are echoing that cry. The burden is not against Israel. It's from within Israel. And God's going to make sure that his message is known. Look at verse 14. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. As the waters cover the sea, that's so completely that we don't ever think of water covering the sea. The water is the sea. And that's how completely God's glory is going to be known in Israel. And God finishes his expression of Habakkuk in chapter 2 with the reminder of his own presence. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Now I want to bring this home a little bit. Where do we think of when we think of the rocks crying out, the stones crying out, and the beams echoing injustice. I think if I could be a fly on the wall of some of our conversations, we're quick to point out the White House or Congress, Wall Street, the Supreme Court. We have any number of other places who we love to complain about injustice. We would say, oh, those walls could talk. Oh, those beams could echo. But brothers and sisters, I would encourage you that we need to look a little closer to home. Pastor Mike, how old is this building? Pretty old. Excellent. I bet these stones could cry out with the injustice that we have inside our own churches. I bet these beings above our heads could echo that concern. And we are like a back at trying to protest our own innocence. I would encourage us to look inside. Look inside our own houses, our own businesses. Inside the walls of your own heart are the stones crying out, are the beams echoing the injustice. The Lord is in this temple. Don't complain before him. Let all the earth be silent. Now, chapter 3. The entirety of chapter 3 is a prayer of Habakkuk in response to this conversation of chapters 1 and 2. Now, don't get the idea that my hands folded, toe-tapping Habakkuk, who hears God speak in chapter 2, just immediately responds chapter 3. The, the way chapter 3 is written is not an off-the-cuff response by the prophet. This is the formal, uh, it's almost a liturgical song of response. You know, uh, toward the end it says, to the choir master. I mean, this is like a psalm. This is a carefully considered, thoughtful response by Habakkuk. Interesting piece of trivia, other than the Psalms, Habakkuk is the only place in the Bible the word Selah is used. Now, go study your Hebrew. Nobody really knows what Selah means. We all see it in the Psalms. It's often in the italics. It says maybe it's a refrain. It's some sort of musical or 
vocal direction, and I think that emphasizes what I'm trying to say. This prayer of Habakkuk is a big deal. This is Habakkuk's awareness of his burden, his acknowledgement of the burden, and his response to God in the face of rebuke. Now, this culminates in verses 17 through 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. This response in chapter 3 is painful to hear. We love to hear God's people rejoicing. The crops are barren. We have no animals in our pen. And yet, this is the voice of in the wilderness, this is the voice of torment. This is the voice of despair. I want to ask you this morning, is this voice familiar to you? I want to be the Habakkuk of chapter 1. I want to stand on my deeds on my actions, on my thoughts. And I want to say, oh God, how long is it going to be till you get rid of all this other junk? How long do you get rid of bloodshed in the world? How long do you get rid of injustice? How long do you get rid of financial impropriety? How long, oh God, are you going to take while the rich take advantage of the poor. Over and over, God, in his mercy, brings me to a place of confession, a place where I'm faced with the rocks crying out of my own heart with those beams responding. God confronts me with my own tyranny, my own injustice. God brings me to the foot of the cross, to the only one who can ask how long. Jesus Christ, the perfect son, the perfect God, takes my feeble complaints and returns only perfect mercy and grace. Brothers and sisters, I bid you.